thank you so much for coming by this morning. I might actually just try this without the mic and tell me if you can hear me out the back. Um, how's, how's everyone back there? Is that fine or should I jump on the mic? I'd rather do it this way. Um, I, uh, I will be looking at my phone. I'm honestly not checking Twitter to see if it's a <laughs> terrible thing to chat my notes here. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, uh, I've been in the games industry for about 15 years now. Uh, my background is working for some of the bigger studios, both locally and internationally. I started professionally in Queensland, working for Irrational Games, who then became 2K. Uh, I then left and worked in Vancouver and Montreal, uh, working for studios over there. Spent uh, 12 months time working for Ubisoft and came back to Brisbane in order to work for Pandemic. Shortly after that, Pandemic was shot all by Electronic Arts. I spent a reasonable amount of time inside the, uh, inside the EA machinery, at, uh, at which point they were the biggest publisher in the world. And uh, shortly after that, they shut down Pandemic in the GFC and closed down a lot of their international business. In the last four years, uh, I've been running a company called Defiant Development, which is a independent game developer that kind of specializes in um, public platforms where we can self-publish. So we've been doing most of our work in mobile because that's been one of the opportunity spaces. But, uh, but more recently, we're working on a game for PC, PS4, and hopefully Xbox One. So that's, that's the sort of broad space we work in. Defiant is currently 15 people, plus or minus a few contractors, depending on what we might happen to be doing at the time. Uh, we do everything in-house. Uh, we sometimes do work for higher work with other publishers, but when we build our own stuff, we do it soon enough, which is to say that, uh, that we provide the funding, we, uh, we do the initial prototyping, we do the specs, we do the writing, we do the game design, we do the development, we get the game out, we do the PR, we do the marketing, we do the publishing, we do the distribution, and in the end, we uh, rise or fall on the basis of that with no external forces to blame, um, which, is, uh, which is wonderful and terrifying in about equal parts. Um, but it really is, you know, it is a business model that fundamentally didn't exist, you know, five years ago. Um, and, uh, and it's a business model that's made possible by the ways that we're seeing platforms open up and by the opportunities that are provided in the, in the current market. I kind of wanted to touch on, because we're talking about you know, kids content, games and conversion, I've done a little bit of work in the kids space, but I'm by far an expert. Um, I've done quite a lot of work in the game space, but I'm by far an expert because there is much more out there than, than one person can know. But, uh, but inside the scope of the stuff I understand, I think I understand it pretty well. Um, nonetheless, I really wanted to talk less about conversion because I don't think anything's converting. And, you know, and I hate to pull the pin out of um, the, the title of the conference, but I, in a lot of ways, we're not talking about conversion, conversions because what we're looking at in the future is not going to, to be a representation of, you know, multiple fields coming together, it's actually going to see us evolving into a whole bunch of new forms that are pretty much unrecognizable from where we stand today. And, and I, I genuinely believe that. I genuinely believe the future is going to have a ton of new content and it will absolutely involve us converging in terms of who we are, the ways we work and the fields we're in. Collaboration across domains is increasing and is absolutely the best way to, to get results. I, I, I think it's across the board for all of us. Um, everybody has so much uh, knowledge in their, their specialist spaces, but the sharing of that and the ways in which we can collaborate and uh, cross communicate is really where the, the explosive stuff around the corner is going to come. Um, so, you know, I see us uh, merging our, you know, sharing our DNA and uh, having multiple generations of weird mutants, uh, <laughs> rather than necessarily <laughs> converging per se. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, 
I thought I'd start and just talk a little bit about business models. And, you know, game development in general used to be a pretty much publisher-driven business model. In a lot of ways, it looked like uh, book publishing, which is to say, you would go to a publisher with a, uh, with a concept um, and some materials that showed that you could execute on that concept and your reputation, and they would give you an advance, and you would use that advance to develop the concept to the end, and then the publisher would publish that, and they would give you a royalty on sales. And that royalty on sales would almost never end up paying back your advance, and you'd end up going cap in hand to, to publisher again to say, hey, we would like you to find that next thing. Um, and it was quite possible to have multiple titles in sequence that, uh, on which you never made back your advance, so on which you never paid for anything other than development costs, but which publishers made a substantial amount extra on, just because of the ways the, the numbers tended to work. Royalties in that space kind of sit in the 10 to 30% um, market, and uh, game budgets over the last, oh, let's say two decades, have consistently increased. So uh, the sorts of games that you would go and buy at a uh, EB Games or, or similar store, um, games for the, the PlayStation 2 or Xbox, the, the first Xbox, not the Xbox One because that's confusing, um, might have budgets of kind of five to $10 million depending on, uh, depending on what was going on. And there was enough of market that you could recoup on that sort of investment. Over the last while, games in the, the AAA space, um, so the games that you see you know, on shelves for between $60 and $100 retail, uh, have ballooned up substantially. They're, they're now very rarely under $50 million. Um, very rarely under $100 million total, including marketing budget. And uh, when you walk out the door and look at the side of the bus, you will see ads on the side of the bus um, and advertising campaigns that are worldwide and uh, a blockbuster attempt to recoup, you know, $100 million investments. Um, the flip side of that is that a game like Call of Duty can do a billion dollars of revenue in its opening week. So everybody's playing big ball. The impact of that is that less bets are being made on less products. Um, uh, for anybody coming from the uh, film side, I'm sure you'll recognise the pattern of inflated budgets, conservative development, and uh, and a lack of new and innovative products. Um, lots of rampant sequelitis, lots of low risk, you know, telling the same story over and over again for a pretty ordinary market, slap bang in the middle. So we went from a pretty diverse series of games um, in which anyone in the top you know, anyone who had a top 20 game in any month would, would happily be recouping to a much more laser-focused tentpole game every month. Those tentpole games make a ton of cash and uh, there's no room for anything else. And that all happened oh, from about, you know, 2005 onwards is when it really became clear that it was critical uh, then into the, the GFC phase where uh, where basically everybody who'd happily been making second tier games at that point in time had to either have up their game to be making huge blockbusters or went out of business. And that was, that was a tough transitional time for the industry. Um, uh, what we have now is a ton of opportunities. And this has all happened over the last four or five years as uh, platforms have opened up, self-distribution has become viable and there are options and opportunities for people to pay you for your work without you having to set up your own you know credit card processing and uh, and business taking money from independence um, that mean there are reasonable business cases to be made for an investment from anything down to like fifty thousand dollar games and a fifty thousand dollar game is the sort of game that you can make even if you don't have $50,000 as, uh, again, I'm sure people coming from the film side know that uh, if everybody works free, then you can get a lot of value without, uh, without necessarily a lot of outlay. There are certain costs that are fixed 
you're probably going to need a computer to work on um, in the same way that you'll probably need some basic equipment. But, uh, but manpower is far and away the number one cost on any games budget. So if you, can, uh, if you can get yourself and some other people together to work on a project on your own, you, you can ship stuff very, very cheaply. It has a reasonable chance of making some money. Um, so there's a business case for games at $50,000. You're probably thinking about smaller mobile games at that point in time. Um, the most recent breakout in that space is Flappy Bird. And like anything, there's a lot of games out there that are made relatively cheaply. Being heard through the noise is very tough. Um, you are not likely to, uh, to end up independently wealthy by accident the next day. It does happen, but I, I, I'm, that's not the dream I'm selling. The, the dream I'm selling is you can make things and get them out to an audience. And, uh, and that is a deeply satisfying thing. And I think, you know, in the end, we're all here because we're in the creative industries. And at its heart, that's what the creative industries is about. But the industry side of that is, can I get a return on an investment? And it's harder down here because a lot of people are, are in the mix down here. Um, there's a lot of noise to stand out on. Once you start to talk about budgets in the $200,000 range, you know, you're talking about uh, pretty polished standout work that, that can have a place. Um, again, primarily, you're likely to be working in the mobile space. But that's a, that's a place that we see games like Monument Valley, which is a recent uh, Apple Design Award winner. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out. It's a beautiful, very neatly put together game. Um, budgets then start to creep up to the, to the million dollar range. And in the million dollar range, you're talking about distribution maybe on Steam or PC, or maybe a downloadable game for PlayStation 4 or Xbox One. And those are places where, you know, if your game <laughs> has a specific audience, if that audience is behind it, you can sell, you know, 50 to 100,000 copies at 20 bucks a piece and, and look at recouping. Those are very, very small numbers of sales for a platform like Steam or for the, the PS4. Um, but there's certainly enough to, to make it work. And again, <coughs> we're talking about a whole bunch of different price points at, with each of these games. You know, you've got everything from these, these mobile games that sell for like 99 cents all the way through to uh, more detailed games on Steam that might sell for 10 or even $20, all the way through to the kind of $50 million AAA games that sell for 100 bucks a pop. Um, that's sort of coincidental in terms of how much money a game can make. You know, uh, something like Angry Birds has sold so many copies. And, uh, and mobile game development is all about reaching out to a huge audience and, and getting a game in front of um, millions of people versus tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands um, or a million. Uh, some of, some of the, the top reaching mobile titles will have 100 million, 200 million users. Now generally, those are free games, not paid games, so they're not getting 99 cents out of everybody. But generally they get some money out of some people and it adds up to something. And, uh, and you can multiply something by 200 million and it still comes out as a nice number. Um, so there are these business opportunities in each of these places. And in almost every one of them now, we're talking about going it alone as being the primary route. Um, once you get to a budget north of a million dollars, then that's, that's still the domain of publishers. You know, that's still the domain of people who can put an ad on a bus for you around the world, who have a dedicated marketing team. Um, but it's also the realm where, unless you've successfully executed one of them before, you're probably not going to be able to make that offer. Uh, not, not a single one of those publishers will take a cold call to their office and could you give me two million dollars up to make a game please. Um, and, and a lot of the reason for that is because uh, games structurally aren't made like films. Um, execution is extraordinarily important. You want a team that's worked together and has a history and can show that they can execute on a game of that, that type and size. Once you get to scale, you know, again, Good idea, interesting hook, unique approach, a couple of people can do a lot. But if you want to get 30 people in a room making a high budget game, then they better have done, done something similar before 
to, to really have a credible um, ability to deliver on that. And that all comes out of the fact that uh, games, broadly, tend to grow. Um, there is not a single way to make a game. Game design documents are not scripts. Um, you can look at a script and you can look at what's on screen at the end and there's a strong relationship between the script and what ends up on screen. Uh, if you look at a game design document, a game design document describes a direction of progress um, and an area of exploration. Uh, games are much more iterative and much more discovered in the process of building them than, uh, than most creative projects. In this, they share the properties of every software development project. Um, and none of this is remarkable from a software development point of view. Uh, it absolutely is a bit more remarkable from a, uh, from a film or a television or a process driven uh, perspective. There's two reasons for that. One is because games isn't a very grown up industry, really. Um, despite having been around in one shape or other as a business since the 70s, it's, it's really only started to deal with these large scale projects over the last decade and a half. And God, a decade and a half is nothing, nothing in the big scheme of things. Um, and it's been changing every year. You know, the cutting edge has been changing pretty dramatically every year, so people find themselves reinventing their process every year. Again, there's only a few people making the big $50 million dollar games. Every one of them has a sort of idiosyncratic process. There's little concept of best practice. Um, a lot of that's, that's not standardised. But again, all of that is beside the point if you want to make smaller projects and make them with a few people because you don't have all of those issues of scale. And we are in the enviable position where the toolkit has opened up. You know, um, Somebody yesterday said it was the, the handicam era of, uh, of game development, and I think that's really true. There are cheap, easily accessible tools that let you make your own stuff. Um, and depending on what sort of stuff you want to make, that, that varies <laughs> dramatically. Uh, something like Twine, which lets you make text adventures simply that can be played by people on the web. Um, if you've got something that's purely narrative, if you come from a background in writing, super worth checking out because <clears throat> you can put a tribe of twine project together in an afternoon if you know what you're doing and if you don't know what you're doing then you can learn how to put a twine project together in an afternoon and make something <laughs> the next afternoon um, and those are effectively kind of digital choose your own adventures you know they're, they're not deeply complex it's not going to push grand theft auto off the slot <laughs> but uh, but they do, they do get you creative and they do enable you to start speaking to an audience and, and making interactive work. Um, because of that, you know, there's also the next stage of tools. You, you get into things that are genre specific. Certainly with the game, it's a lot easier if you're working in an established genre with established rules to, uh, to do what you need to do. You know, uh, you, you have a lot less complexity to worry about if your game can borrow a standard rule set and, and a way that the universe works from a similar game. So um, there are things like adventure game tool set, um, tool kit, I think, which, uh, which as you might guess is very much specifically around building adventure games. Um, there are uh, more broad tools like Corona, which is uh, primarily focused on making games that feature 2D assets. So for people with an animation background or an illustration background, um, if they can pair up with one technical person, uh, Corona's a good way of getting interesting things on screen. Um, all the way up to Unity, which is kind of a general purpose engine for all sorts of things. But again, you know, we used to build our own engines. Um, in, in effect, we used to build our own kind of cameras from scratch at, on every project. And, uh, and it's so nice to be able to get one off the shelf that does 95% of what you want, um, but is actually a proper tool. You know, we, we would regularly have things where, uh, where in order to make the tool work, you would have to, you know, do what you wanted to do in the editor, save it, and then press the button that said put that in the game. <coughs> but that wouldn't actually do anything. Then you had to open a folder and copy a file over and delete another file. And you only knew that because somebody else on the team had told you that's how it worked, because nobody had ever actually made it work smoothly. These days, the tools you get, they all, they all work pretty smoothly. If you say put it in game, it goes and <coughs> you know, 
or there's something wrong with it, and somebody will fix it pretty shortly. So, um, so the standard of tools across the board is much better, no matter what you're doing, and no matter what scale you're working with. And also, they're really cheap. Um, Unreal, which is an engine that's used to make AAA games, um, that uh, that's responsible for, for Gears of War and Splinter Cell and a ton of other big games, currently costs nine dollars per user per month to uh, to use at home. Um, and that is exactly the same tool used by teams with $50 million budgets. So the, the barriers to entry across the board in terms of making content have gone away. The flip side of that is that you pay them on the back end, uh, they take a percentage. Um, and <coughs> no matter how you do things, there will be people taking percentages. You're normally gonna lose 30% to a platform holder, just out of the gate. So if you're on iTunes, Apple will take 30%. If you're on Google Play, Google will take 30%. If you're on Steam, Steam will take 30%. If you're on PlayStation Network, I presume they take 30%. I actually haven't read that bit of the contracts yet. But um, it, every distributor will take something. And, uh, and if you don't want to pay upfront for your tools, then it's possible you make an arrangement where you know, the tool company will take something out of the back end. Uh, there are people who might do PR and marketing for you in exchange for something out of the back end. But the fact remains that even if you do a deal with everybody, and you probably shouldn't have to, um, you should still end up with 50% of gross receipts in your pocket when all is said and done, which is a massive difference to 10% of gross receipts as it used to be in the old days, and that 10% of gross receipts only coming once you paid back your entire budget at 10%. Um, to, to be clear there, when you used to get an advance, you might get a million dollars in advance, and then the game would have to sell $10 million because you'd have to get your million dollars back out of the 10% you were owed. So uh, the company that gave you the million dollars would get $9 million back. You would get no, nothing back because you'd spend that, and from $10 million onwards, you would start getting sales, um, which was not as awesome. Um, so the most important thing that, that you can do if you're interested in making a game, is to understand scope and scale. I, I've spoken about budgets, and in each case, when I talk about budgets, I'm really talking about time and manpower. You know, how many people are on this project for how long? Uh, because as I said, 90% of the budget, realistically, is in uh, is in people. So. The, the people who are going to work on your project, the people who are going to put their time in, they are the vast majority of your expense. Um, that means that you need to have a good idea of how much a game might cost to make. You know, you need to be able to look at games on the market, look at Angry Birds and say, how many people do I think worked on that and for how long? Uh, and it's not necessarily easy to get hold of those numbers. Um, it's easier for some games than others. But, uh, but there's a site called Moby Games, which lists the credits of every game they can get their hands on, and gives you one good way to kind of have a look at how big a team was. Um, if you want to do that, I would say that my rule of thumb is to look at everybody in development and ignore people in publishing, because they're a separate expense. But look at everybody in development, so everybody who has a title like programmer, artist, writer, uh, designer and add up all of those people and about two thirds of them is your your the bulk of people who are there for the bulk of the project um, we always tend to bring extra people on to ship a game so you know you end up with a total number of people that's more inflated but if you take two thirds and multiply it by the length of the project then you can get a good idea how do you work out how long the project went for that's when you start stalking people online and you know checking their uh, checking the, the press releases they've made, looking for the, the ways they've talked about it, and all of that starts to give you a general idea of oh look this this game had six people on it for twelve months, um, or this game had you know fifty people on it for four years, and from that you can get a sense of how much it would cost to make if you had to pay all those people, and all of this is about honing the way that you look at a game so that when you want to create your own game, you have a reasonable idea of how much it should cost to make. Even if you don't know like the, the details and the ins and outs. Um, 
you need to be able to put together some sort of kind of preliminary budget and some sort of fact checking around your ideas in order to realistically be, uh, be building. Um, I think one of the real assets that we have these days in the games industry is that the GFC pretty much decimated the, uh, the high-end AAA developers and left a lot of people without work. So there is now an indie community that is collaborative, strong, community focused and, uh, and very, very helpful. Uh, in Queensland, that's primarily through the IGDA and, uh, and meetups like the Big Dev Meetup that ha happens at the Manabar. Um, it's also through local conferences like GCAP and PAX. Uh, there are regular events like this one um, and a chance to meet other developers talk to them and uh, get a sense of what, what they're up to. The development community overall is incredibly non-competitive. The, the nature of the way we do business, the smaller indies, and I speak you know, for people from like two to 20 in terms of studios, is that we're never competing with the person down the road. You know, we're all competing on the world market. Um, for us, you know, a, a good portion of our revenue comes from the US, uh, Another good portion of our revenue comes from China. Um, there are, our games <coughs> sell pretty well, but they don't sell anywhere near Angry Birds. <coughs> Even if they did, you know, we, we're not competing with the people who make Fruit Ninja up the road. Um, we all share, we all collaborate, we all work together. And that's true online of the international game development community as well. You know, if you need uh, somebody to collaborate with you in a skill set that you don't have, possible exception of finding programmers, and I'll get to that, but if you need to collaborate with a, a musician, an artist, uh, somebody who does you know, motion video, somebody who does illustrations, there, there are lots of people, a writer, there, there are tons of people out there who are happy to collaborate if you're uh, working in a professional fashion and uh, communicating and sharing in a professional fashion. Part of the reason that programmers are not such a good option for that is because every programmer on the planet gets hit up 10 to 15 times per day by somebody saying, hey, I've got a great idea, you should do all the work and I'll take half the cash, <laughs> let's do that. Um, that's just kind of an endemic to the trade. Uh, and in a similar fashion, there are, if you are a composer, that's, that's a tougher gig because there are a lot of composers, a lot of freelance composers out there. And for whatever reason, the big houses tend to kind of, you know, zone in on three or four who do all the work. So there are a lot of indies who are fantastic um, and a lot of composers out there. And I would suggest from that perspective that you know, there are some really good collaboration opportunities. Um, Jim Guthrie, who worked with the uh, Super Brothers on a game called Sword and Sorcery. That's Sorcery with a W. Um, that was a fantastic collaboration between a, a musician bringing a really personal style, a couple of artists bringing a really personal style, and a game that, that stands out incredibly distinctly. Um, the same is true of a game recently released uh, called, Bast uh, called Transmission uh, by a team who did a game previously called Bastion. Um, there have been really good examples of collaborations with voiceover artists. Uh, there's a game called Stanley Parable that's 100% that's a very standard moving down a corridor style game, but has a narrator who spends the entire time with a deep relaxing voice, you know, nar narrating your life to you and pointing out how, uh, how every day things are different and you reach the end of a very short sequence and then you play it again and then you reach the end of the corridor and he says things like, but you can't have helped but wonder what happens if you turn right instead of left? <laughs> and the whole thing is opened up by this, this ongoing dialogue. So again, that's, that's one of those examples of that kind of uh, DNA swapping and mutation that I'm talking about, where, where collaboration with somebody who's fantastic in their field and somebody who's, uh, who's exciting in the games field offers really new opportunities and, and new ways to, to go forward. Um, and that's where talent, you know, is everything in the end, um, both inside games and outside of games. You know, talent, originality, and, uh, and a willingness to experiment. Is, uh, 
is absolutely where the exciting work of today is coming from, um, helped by the fact that uh, we have a high-end games industry that's become incredibly unadventurous, um, incredibly by the book, and is continuing to address a very small fraction of the audience. Uh, Truna threw up the numbers yesterday, but you can pretty much say that 92% uh, of the population play games in one fashion or another, that the games audience is pretty evenly split, half male, half female, that the demographics are pretty evenly split um, with a little clumping around the, uh, around the 20s to 30s. Um, and so particularly in terms of spending, you know, that's where the, the, the biggest spending clump is. So if you want to pick out like a single, a single demographic that, that spends the most, it is by a small fraction, uh, 15 to, to 30 year old males, by a small fraction. But that's incredibly unadventurous because every other demographic is engaged and nobody makes stuff for them. That's less true than it used to be. But, uh, but there's certainly some huge opportunities that run right, right through that block. Um, so it's really interesting to see the switch that we're making there from kind of process and, uh, and content and very formulaic driven uh, games. You know, games where the, the budget sits in a very specific range and, and every game runs the same to, to a much more content driven model where, where people are collaborating around ideas and what needs to be done for those ideas. This is massively helped by crowdfunding. Um, we did some crowdfunding for our game late last year and we raised uh, $54,000, which was <laughs> fantastic. But it wasn't that so much as the fact that we found 2,000 people who were passionate about what we were doing, who were happy to engage, who kept in touch with us, who regularly communicated with us about what we were doing, um, to whom we could show work in progress and they would tell us you know, what they thought in a very honest fashion. Um, people on the internet are super honest. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's really good, like you do need to, I think um, for me as a creative person, letting people in on the process of seeing unfinished work is, is uh, look, well, there's kind of two ways of saying this, it's, it's something I'm not hugely accustomed to and, uh, and it's not been a part of my process in the past. Um, which is another way of saying, oh my God, it's fucking terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> like, holy crap, it is hard to let people into things you know are not up to your standard and let them see how the sausage is made. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that those people get engaged because that's what they would like to do. They, they would like to be in there on the ground floor. And, uh, and it's very, very tough on the ego, um, and it's really, uh, I, think, I think, you know, the natural response is to kind of knee jerk on all that sort of stuff and go, yes, of course we're gonna fix that. What do you think we are, idiots? Um, it's obviously broken. But along with the things that you knew needed fixing, people will point out a bunch of stuff that wasn't necessarily on your radar. And for us, it's meant that we've, we're doing much more, what previously would have been a process of working with a bunch of loose and disparate parts over the course of development, quite a long time, assembling them, assembling, assembling them, finally getting those loose and disparate parts together, polishing it up, polishing it up, putting it in a box and setting it out the door, has now become a much more, uh, a much more spiky process, and it will work on some things, and then we'll try and bring the game to a point where we can send it out to people. It's not finished, but at least, you know, at least you don't need to know the, the secret code of, you know, don't press any buttons for the, while the game is loading, otherwise it all crashes, or, the other things that we might put up with during development every day. Um, and then, you know, we continue to add more stuff and it all gets a bit chaotic and broken, and then we polish it up so that, again, we can show it to people. And we've been, since, uh, since December of last year, we've been uh, giving people in our, uh, in our uh, Kickstarter backer group and, and people who've come on board since then um, builds of the game every, uh, Every month or so, so there's been a, a you know ready for prime time version every month or so that's still you know missing some key features, but uh, but it's polished up and that's that's caused us to work in a completely different fashion this way around. And there's no doubt that what we're making is absolutely the better for it um, because <coughs> it keeps us honest and uh, 
it forces us to kind of confront the things we have done and the things we haven't done and the things that are done at a standard where people can see them versus the things that aren't. Um, so that's, uh, that's been like one of the, the benefits, but I, and I think, you know, from my perspective, if I was to, to say to a developer today, you know, how should I start out a project? We've got a newish team, we've got a project, we, we want to make it, and uh, my suggestion would be that you put together a mock Kickstarter campaign pretty much out of the gate to make sure that you know what it is you're making, how you'll sell it to your audience, what the appeal of that is. It may, in the end, it not be worthwhile doing a Kickstarter early. You may want to gather materials to show that you can credibly execute on the thing you've promised. But, uh, but if your premise is this is a game like all the other games, it's really, really hard to stand out in that market. Um, but if your premise has a, a unique hook, um, as, uh, as there was a game about scaling things up and down that I saw the other day where you had a gun that could shrink things and grow them. Um, and the little demo for that was they had a little frog that was chasing you and you made the frog enormous and then you jumped inside it and, uh, and there were things inside it and you could run around and do the things inside it. And it, it was immediately apparent that this was not like any other game that I had played. And it was immediately apparent what the pitch was. And it was easy for, for that um, off the basis of a really snappy video that showed all the potential to, uh, to raise its funds. Um, I have a ton of questions about how that, all that's going to work in practice, but, uh, but I was sold the dream. And that's something that I think game developers overall are pretty bad at, and, uh, and I hope people who are converging are better at, is, uh, is the process of thinking about your market early, thinking about sales, thinking about marketing, thinking about how all of that's going to come together. Um, if, if you can come at something with a unique pitch, then if you think you can put together a pitch that will get an audience on board, Crowdfunding offers a really good way of testing that very early in the process. Um, you know, if, if I had the option now for all of our games, we'd just, you know, take the five pitches we're working on, put together five Kickstarters and make the one that people liked. Um, now that's a terrible idea because people would not like the fact that we had five up simultaneously and, you know, they would, uh, they would get grumpy about the ones that we didn't make and, uh, and all of those sorts of things. But I still think it's, uh, it's overall a, particularly for, for people setting out, putting that idea up early and being prepared to drop it if it doesn't find a market, rather than limping on with it, is, uh, is a good idea because the most important thing at every level, but most importantly with small budget games, is uh, can you stand out from the noise? You know, do you have a way of communicating what's unique and exciting about your game to the audience and getting them on board so that they'll show up? Um, and to do that, you want an idea that, that's, that's catchy and newsworthy. Um, I think, without fail, when I talk to people who come from a uh, more traditional media background, um, we, we, did a, uh, we did a project with, uh, with a film director and a journalist, um, and that was a fantastic process. We have, I have in the past done a lot of uh, contracting with with people on the television side, people who come from the, the pure writing or, or novel side. Um, the tendency is to think of games as a storytelling medium. And uh, it's worth stressing that games are not a storytelling medium, at least not in the fashion that we tend to think about storytelling. Games can include storytelling, absolutely. Games need not include storytelling. Uh, a game like Minecraft has, has no narrative um, and almost no world building, in fact. And almost no sense of cohesion, probably. It's basically Lego. <laughs> the story of Lego is not particularly deep. Um, although you can make a story out of Lego, you know, there's, there's nothing stopping it. Um, but games are about experience. That experience can have a story base, um, and that experience can lack a story base. That experience can be authored, or that experience can be unauthored. Um, or that experience can be of a class of experiences that are authored to be possible, but not explicitly authored. Uh, in this fashion, games often share more with architecture than they do with filmmaking. Because 
what you're fundamentally doing is building a space that is conducive to a certain sort of open experience. Um, you're setting up a bunch of things in which the player will, will take their own actions and build their own meaning around those actions. Um, I, I like to use the example of Grand Theft Auto. You know, Grand Theft Auto has a story. Um, it's a some sort of massively convoluted crime story, uh, depending on which one you're playing, where you're either an immigrant or uh, or somebody living in the uh, in the, the ghettos, or you know, some sort of drug dealer. Um, and you go through a number of relationships and back and forth with different people, and you end up with a cast of thousands and trying to remember, you know, why am I double crossing this person? It doesn't really matter. Um, the stories are. Pretty well done um, by game standards, uh, but they're not in any way the important part of Grand Theft Auto. You ask anybody who plays Grand Theft Auto to tell you a story, and that about Grand Theft Auto, it will not be any of those stories. It will not be any, any of those stories that were written. It will not be any of those stories that were presented through cutscenes. It won't be uh, the the story that was authored. Now they'll tell you a story about what they did and the experiences they had in the world. They'll tell you about the story about the time they were driving away from the cops and they crashed into the barrier and flew out the front of the window into the river onto a jet ski and took off. Um, because that's what sticks, that's what is exciting, that's what was lived. And that's why people play these games. Um, so you want to think about the experiences as, as your starting point that people will have. Um, story is fantastic in that it provides context for experience. So GTA, because it's provided all of the context of you being in the criminal heist narrative, gives you an opportunity to you know, have meaning around the fact that you stole that police car and you were on the run. Um, the, the job of narrative is to provide that, that context. Now that said, again, this is a spectrum. It goes all the way from a game like Heavy Rain, which is effectively an authored story with, uh, with film quality, uh, you know, well, a film quality of, uh, of story and cutscenes and uh, editing and, uh, and performance, all the way down to something like Tetris or something like Minecraft, which has nearly no story of any kind of meaning or impact. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the place of story. So as, as you think about games, make sure that you're not just looking at the story lab. And, and that ties into my, my kind of overall perception, which is, or my overall most important point, which is if you're interested in the game space, then do what you would do and what you would expect if you were interested in the film space. Um, nobody would trust a director who didn't watch movies. But I've seen a lot of people try and make games who don't play games. Um, and the most common thing I hear from, without wanting to be ageist, uh, old film directors, um, is, well, my kids play games, I've watched them play a lot of games, I know what it takes. And that's the same as saying, well, I've stood behind the television set and watched people watching TV. So, you know, I could make the surprise. Um, <laughs> They're an experiential medium. If you haven't experienced them, then you haven't done it. And, uh, and like any medium, you should be literate because, oh my God, games is interesting right now. Like if you think games is Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto and Angry Birds, and those are the examples I use because they're nice and universal and everybody's heard of them, then you are so wrong, unbelievably wrong. The exciting thing about games is games like The Wedding, games like Dear Esther, games like Gone Home, um, what's happening in the indie space, games like FTL, the ways in which mechanics are being developed, games about construction, games about uh, games about destruction, games are about architecture, games about uh, games about the architecture of building prisons. Prison Architect is a really really interesting game that involves you know putting you in and making you uh, manage the resources of a prison. Um, there are so many different voices. There are games about depression. Um, there are games about loss. There are games about sexuality. If you don't know this. You don't know games, and you shouldn't start making them until you do. It's not that hard to become a literate. You know, the internet is awesome. Uh, it's got like a, quite a lot of stuff on it. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's pretty broad. Um, but, uh, but all of that information is, is out there. 
And there are all of these opportunities to look at the ways people are creating and then to look at you know, what you have as a voice and what you have to offer and the ways that you can bring those elements together. Um, and that, that, to me, is the exciting thing. That, that is where we all converge, learn from one another, share what we have in an intimate fashion and go on to make crazy mutant babies that, uh, that redefine what the, uh, what the next generation of games can be. And maybe some of those are an evolutionary dead end. Like, God knows most of them probably will be, but some of them will also be the next big thing. You know, some of them will be the, uh, the excitement of the future. And, and that, I think, is really, 